With Yuha Bak soon to bring the world to its knees and the fate of Soul Society on the line, the Thousand Year Blood War truly feels like a final arc. In these times of desperation, some of the most unlikely individuals arrive to stand alongside our Shinigami to protect the fate of the various worlds. However, I use the term stand alongside very loosely because one of our unlikely allies is in fact seated on a very nice chair. If you're new to this series, we cover Bleach from a completely blind perspective of never having read the manga or seen the anime. Since starting this journey, I've fallen in love with this dark story, and by the end of this final arc, it may just go down as my favorite story of all time. So if you haven't already, please drop a subscription and sit back and relax, because this is my blind review of Bleach. With the arrival of Ichigo to the battlefield to save Kimpachi, it seemed as if we were about to finally see our main man back in action, but oh boy, not much of that happens. Instead, Yuhabak makes his move and ascends to the royal palace with his two figurative sons within Uryu and Hashwalth. Yuhabak is able to ascend to the royal palace due to Ichigo descending from it, causing the defensive capabilities of the palace to be unable to be resealed temporarily. This theme of Ichigo unintentionally aiding the enemy is something that continually pops up throughout this arc, and I can't imagine the frustration this brings Ichigo. Honestly, I figured Squad Zero would have been able to think this through, but it led me to speculate that perhaps this was part of their plan. Ichigo heads directly for Yuha, but he's continually thwarted by a large number of Sternritter, but the Sternritter seem to be foolish to the notion that the protagonist can't have an intense fight with the likes of them, Plot armor suggests otherwise. Ichigo as a result brushes them to the side, and he's continually outnumbered, but in an Avengers-esque scene, our Shinigami arrive to clear the path for Ichigo to pursue Yuhabak, who seems to be his final fight. Of the fights with the Sternritter, these were some of my favorite because they possess some of the most interesting characters. Most notably, Bosby who is a big favorite of mine upon this section of the arc, and unsurprisingly, he's a fan favorite as well. One of the things I like to do as I read Bleach is that after a really cool chapter, I'll go find the Reddit thread from when that chapter was released to hear the people's thoughts who were at the time reading it weekly. Quickly I learned that Bosby was well loved and Kubo's pacing was highly disliked, but knowing how Reddit threads are, negativity tends to be the overwhelming theme, which is why I tend to skim over the negative comments and instead see what everybody else was enjoying at this time. It makes me feel part of the dialogue, even though obviously I'm reading almost a decade old thread. Hell, I'm sure I could find some of y'all in this thread if I really did my deep research, but I digress. While Ichigo pursues Yuhabak, Uberyu stops Ichigo from advancing, which shook Ichigo emotionally. Despite their argumentation and differences, they've always been friends and allies, but here Uberyu stands as a roadblock to Ichigo, preventing Ichigo from enacting his plan and playing the role of Yuha's successor to a T. I personally haven't believed that Uberyu has truly sided with Yuha, instead I have strong feelings he is instead plotting a plan to defeat Yuha and is fitting for him to do so on a personal stealth-like mission due to his personality type of always wanting to handle things by himself. With Uberyu stopping Ichigo, the three Quincy leaders head up to the Spirit Palace, the very place Ichigo just came from. I couldn't help but laugh a little bit. After all this time it took Ichigo to come down, now it's time for him to come right back up. With Otohime and Chad giving Ichigo a pep talk after witnessing this, our crafty Urahara arrives to offer them help in returning to the royal palace. Urahara clutch as always, he has a nice ability within copying others' ideas, like the healing properties of the hot spring, and now Kukaku's cannon to shoot them up to the royal palace. During the discussion of the logistics and sending them back up, Yorichi makes her way back into the story and now the gang is all back together. Time and time again, Urahara cements himself as a god within this story, crafting the damn plot and essentially knowing everything, and my god, I'm all here for it. What I'm also all here for is Urahime's outfit, but I'm sure we already all know that. While Urahara and the gang prepare for their now ascent back to the royal palace, Bosby and Renji have a face-off, but it felt honestly more like a bromance. They trash talk each other, but in a way two good friends would, and hell, they even backhand compliment each other. Both Bosby and Renji have the Vegeta-esque character type with a something to prove demeanor, so it only makes sense for them to like each other despite being on opposite sides of battle. Giselle's fight also stood out to me, and while encountering Yumachika, I had to reread their dialogue. Yumachika uncovers the biggest plot twist of the century, and he tells Giselle that despite claiming she's a woman, he in fact knows she's a man because she stinks of semen. I'm not sure how much semen it takes for Yumachika to be able to smell it, but I genuinely laughed hysterically through their encounter. At this point, Giselle has yet to admit to his accusations, but due to calling herself a girl, we'll go with that. Giselle brings back Bambietta as a zombie during this fight to cause havoc on the battlefield, and there's a lot of very odd sexual undertones. 
This arc in general is a lot more sexual than previous ones, and it seems Kubo is really going all out. Eventually, she's met by our praise, the Sun Captain Mayuri, and they begin battling. Mayuri even goes so far as to throw out what seemed at first glance to be Pokeballs, but they serve as a counter to Zombie Bambiata's abilities. Just countering one zombie isn't enough though, she summons many now under her control, but Mayuri isn't alone in his endeavors. He brings back characters I'm not sure anybody was asking for, those being some of the previous Arankar. I wasn't expecting to see Charlotte or Dordoni ever again, but I found them hysterical in the Waco Mundo arc. With so much comedy sprinkled in with all this violence and gore, the juxtaposition really made this feel like a roller coaster of an arc emotionally. It seems also Kubo's favorite thing to do during the Thousand Year Blood War is to bring back old characters, and this is only the beginning of that theme. As the fight progresses, eventually Hitsugaya is brought forth as an overpowered zombie, and man, Hitsugaya keeps getting the short end of the stick, and it feels like he's just taking a beating. In his zombie form, he gets a terrible matchup against our very own mad scientist, who uses an Izanami without even needing a Sharingan. He puts his subject in a continual loop and eventually administers a medicine to counteract the zombification. Every time Mayuri fights, despite knowing he's a good guy, he seems like the villain delighting and experimenting on his foe, and I honestly can't believe when he was first introduced as a character I disliked him, because over time Mayuri has grown on me so much as a lovable madman. There were a lot of stern murders in this battle, but a lot of them are taken out within the same chapter their fights begin, and I think that's really due to the nature of how many characters are introduced in this arc. With so many characters, it's damn near impossible to include full fleshed out development with each and every one due to time constraints, so it's clear which individuals Kubo chooses to focus on. Yuhabaka then arrives to the Spirit Palace within a single chapter, much faster than Ichigo Descendant may I add, and here's where things get even more interesting. Yuhabak calls the Spirit Palace a decayed gravestone foreboding in a villainous fashion what was soon to come, and their invasion now begins. At this point, I had extremely high expectations for Squad Zero. They're literally the most elite division of Shinigami, which made the subsequent fight all the more telling of the power of the Quincy. The first to stand as the barrier to Yuha Bok's invasion is Tenjiro, but Tenjiro can't land a single hand on Yuha, and he was followed by Shudera. This is due to the ability of the Sternmurder W who twists enemies' attacks, and it's a quite powerful ability defensively, but Shutara in such quick fashion rewove the entire garb of Sternmurder W and kills him with ease. During this encounter, some of the towers appear to be cloth blowing in the wind, and upon reading it initially, I didn't really understand, but retrospectively, it foreshadowed that the grounds they're currently on aren't in fact the true royal palace. The first impression of Squad Zero in action is scary, but the real fear begins with Yuha unveiling his royal guards. I had figured they existed, but now seeing them before Yuha is truly terrifying. Gerard Valkyrie, Lily Barrow, Pernita, and Oscan Nock Lavar. Of the group, Pernita drew the most questions from me due to there being no apparent face or skin, but they were all designed fantastically. I was genuinely surprised to see Askin, who was the only one brought from down below of the regular Sternmurder, and he's always seemed to be a jokester who isn't overly serious. With their introduction, we see them in action, Gerard fights with brutish strength like Kenpachi, and I imagine due to this, they'll later match up against each other. Then we see Lily Barrow as a sniper, then Pernita with some scary power to twist and brutalize the body of others. Lily Barrow headshots Shutara, but as anticipated, it wasn't her real body. In fact, the Royal Palace grounds weren't real either. This was a false area created by Shutara, demonstrating that her skills go far beyond simply creating Shuhaka Show. She informs the Quincy that the true royal palace is being guarded by none other than their very own monk, Ichibi. Ichibi, the last bastion of defense, my god, I had no idea how much I would love his character. With the other remaining Squad Zero members arriving into a birdcage of sorts created by Hikafune, things seem to be looking up for the Shinigami. Namaya finally unveils his swordsmanship and rather than a scabbard, it's concealed in a liquid due to his sword being so sharp that it would cut through a typical scabbard. Namaya by himself single-handedly fights the royal guard with utmost confidence and poise. It's gruesome. Him cutting down every royal guard shows why he's the creator of the Zanpak Toe. His dialogue always makes me laugh, and seeing him with that same lackadaisical speech while fighting makes him all the more badass. Of the royal guard, the one to last the longest against Namaya was Askin, and this is due to his shrift of death dealing, he can raise or lower the lethal dose of any substance, and he uses this ability to lower the lethal dose of blood in Namaya's body. Honestly, this ability is so unique and it's not something I would have imagined would exist, but Kubo is clearly not short on ideas for powers as we later learn. Askin through this fight shows off further his unassuming nature, and he grew a lot on me with this development. He's a bit of a troll. Unfortunately for Askin, Namaya upon learning this ability cuts himself and loses his own blood, and he utilizes Tenjiro's hot spring water to replace all the blood in Namaya's body, and he cuts down Askin. I really have to emphasize, 
Namaya soloed the entire Royal Guard, and the hype for Squad Zero was living up to the potential I felt they had, but horror, or should I say Ashwulan, soon took place. Down below, the Quincy begin to be hit by light, and their life force and energy are absorbed from the Quincy judged to be unnecessary. It redistributes the power to these key Quincy who just lost, now revitalized, they essentially off-screen the remaining Squad Zero members outside of Ichibi. During this reveal, we can see the anger from Bosby and Lilato clearly resisting the Ashwulan, and their anger towards Yuha Box serves a much greater plot point later on. It gave me hope that these characters down below, the Stern Ritter who have so much potential wouldn't die, because it would truly be such a shame for these characters to be taken out of the story when they still have so much potential. Shunzui, upon seeing this, takes his leave of position and he sets out. He knows what's going on. And while setting out, he runs into Ukitake, who we haven't seen in ages, and we learn that Ukitake prepared something called Kamikake, which was entirely ominous at first glance, and it foreboded much more darkness to come with our white-haired friend. Shunzui doesn't stay long, though. He heads to Central 46. He knows what he needs to do, and it's something that I asked for last video. But before we get to his mission, we need to talk about one of the best fights in Bleach. Yuhabak advances towards the Royal Palace with the last bastion of Shinigami in his way. He also be Ichibe. And despite how he's acted towards our Shinigami, he's not the calm and gentle monk he seems to be. Literally in his opening words to Yuha upon Yuha calling his name, Ichibi tells him he speaks his name quite lightly, and not to come crying when he gets his throat crushed. Ichibi is the king of shit-talking as we soon learn, and he'd fare well in Xbox Live lobbies. But most importantly, Ichibi is the type of Shinigami who exemplifies what it truly means to be one. To his allies, he's gentle, helpful, and a teacher. But to his foes, he's ruthless, unwavering, and a complete monster. Yuhabak has harmed the Serate, killed his fellow Squad Zero members, and now seeks to overtake the Soul Palace. Ichibi has every right to talk down to Yuhabak, and the manner in which he speaks shows right away that Ichibi is far older than Yuha. Ichibi speaks as someone far wiser, more powerful, as an elder. And I swear if not for plot armor, Ichibi would have ended the story right here. Despite not having an intricate backstory, there's few characters I've developed so much love for this fast, and I'd be a damn liar if I didn't admit Ichibi as one of the best characters within the story. Ichibi literally marks a space with his paintbrush, and he informs Yuha he'll beat him within this space, and Yuha informs Ichibi the contrary, that three paces in front of it is where he'll die. I thought this was just villain talk from Yuha, but boy he wasn't lying. Ichibi takes great offense to Yuha's using of his name so casually, and he smacks him with a giant hand, and through the opening sequence of this fight, Ichibi seems like the overpowered villain, not Yuha. Ichibi in his dialogue refers to Yuha as a brat despite aging, and really drives home the point of Ichibi's age, that he's known Yuha since his genesis. An absolute badass. Through the fight, I was so entranced by Ichibi's ability. We learned that his brush doesn't cut flesh, but instead names. He cuts the strength of Yuha in half and the trash talk continues, calling Yuha a half-man. Ichibi, despite his appearance, is so much more fearsome than I could ever imagine. He's the leader of the Shinigami and for good reason. He's the strongest. Yuha isn't a slouch though, and he informs Ichibi that no one can take from him that is his. That all things in this world are his for the taking. This desire to rule, to control, to have, it builds up so much of the villainy for Yuha, and just as I think Yuha will turn the table, Ichibi informs Yuha that he cut his strength in half to preserve his reputation, not because he's scared. That it would look terrible for the Quincy's for their leader to be beaten at full strength so easily. This fight feels like both Yuha and Ichibi doing their trump cards and informing the other who's truly in control. With these two monsters, it felt like a game of I've got you, and no, rather I've got you. We eventually see Ichibi's eyes turn white and we see the ability of Ichimanji. Anything its ink covers loses its name, so Yuha's sword and Quincy Cross all lose their name. What an overpowered ability. His ability is literally black. All the black in the world becomes his, and this doesn't bode well for a man with black hair and a black mustache. He can take away names and subsequently their power, and I swear to god, I'll say it again, if not for plot armor, Yuha would have been defeated. Ichibi's Bonkai allows him to carve a new name into anything that's been covered in his ink, and he gives the new name Kuoari to Yuha, making him equivalent to a black ant crawling around on the ground. This Bonkai isn't just an offensive weapon, theoretically he can make his own allies stronger by granting them a new name. Names are a central factor in Bleach's power system. Chanting incantations, calling out to one Zanpakuto, the naming of abilities. Names hold power within this story, which is what makes Ichibi's abilities so damn strong. Despite removing the name of Yuha's sword and cross, now writing Yuha a new name, Ichibi is met with the overwhelming power with his script A being the Almighty. A godly ability for a godly character, it grants him the ability to see and know all that will occur. His vision is clearly extremely powerful with him opening his true eye with the appearance of multiple irises. 
Something in Shonen Doctrine must state that overpowered characters have powers through their eyes, and despite how much it's used, I always find it to be such a cool awakening in power. The final attack from Ichibi takes place where he assembles a shrine constructed of black tombstones to bear a yuha in that would go so far as to prevent his reincarnation. To do this, Ichibi stole 100 Knights of Soul Society from 100 years in the future. This eyeball monk can literally bend aspects of time to take away knights. Unreal. Despite this entire chapter being built around Ichibi's final attack, Yuha reminds us that he's the final villain, and he tells Ichibi that he is not nameless. He is Yuha Bak, the one to take everything from him, and he dismembers Ichibi. This scene was so gruesome as he literally rips apart our monk in the exact place he foresaw. Kubo in writing has made Yuha Bak into one of the strongest characters in modern shonen. Yuha is omniscient. Anything he sees loses its power and turns to his side. At the moment of writing this, I genuinely have no idea how Yuha can be defeated. I wish Squad Zero was a little bit more fleshed out, but I'm blessed to have been able to witness the fight that was Ichibi versus Yuha because it was absolutely incredible and I'm so excited for it to be animated. Ichibi, despite his loss, established himself as one of the most memorable characters within this arc, juxtaposing the calm nature of a monk with a bloodthirsty and arrogant warrior. And due to his power, if he fought almost versus anyone else, it would have resulted in him being victorious with ease. Fighting versus someone with the name Yuha Bak the Almighty is a bit of an unfavorable matchup, and it made the reputation of our late great Yamamoto, God rest his soul, all the more legendary knowing he was able to defeat Yuha Bak back then. I'm unsure if Yuha possessed the same shrift back then, but it sure as hell is a god tier power. With it being so many chapters since Ichigo fought, it set the expectations really high for just how powerful he got due to his training, but even with his new power-ups, I feel he'll need a god on his side to help defeat Yuha. Ichigo and the gang arrive short after Ichibi's apparent death, but Ichigo hears a voice and calls out Ichibi's name, thus reviving and restoring his body. A notable point of dialogue in response to Ichigo saying that this concept is ridiculous, Ichibi says it rather makes perfect sense due to both of their powers. Obviously, Ichibi's power is over names, but it gives me the impression Ichigo's power has more depth and hidden ability than meets the eye. In a scene that parallels Byakuas, Ichibi tells Ichigo to protect the Spirit King, and he apologizes for having to entrust Ichigo with this mission. I had suspicions of Squad Zero due to this apology that perhaps Ichibi knew the outcome wouldn't be in their favor, or that there was something more nefarious hidden for them to uncover. If he knows they couldn't defeat Yuha Bak, it makes me question why in the world he'd ask the request of stopping him. Ichibi literally says for them to rest easy, that peace is always that way, and he calls out Yuha Bak's name. This is incredibly ominous and lines up with Yuha Bak claiming he seeks peace and hates conflict. I also found it fishy that a lot of Squad Zero was off-screened, and due to the off-screening, it made me feel perhaps there's more to Squad Zero's true intentions and their power. I had a lot of conspiracies that Squad Zero could have been the true villains, but I have yet to be proven right on the speculation. Yuha during this time arrives to the Spirit King, and he states that the Spirit King likely saw this future as well, but he was unable to do anything. And Yuha then stabs the Spirit King, calling him his father, and my god, we were right. This omnipotence Yuha possesses makes even further sense now. He truly is the figurative son of God and acts as the Christ. In the Spirit King's eyes, only upon understanding Yuha's awakening do I now see that the Spirit King also has multiple irises, possessing likely the same omniscience as Yuha. I expected the Spirit King to put up a fight and be powerful, but rather he's limbless and seemingly imprisoned. A god who holds the worlds together, but he doesn't seem to possess inherent control over himself or his situation. And it paints the hypothetical picture that Squad Zero, rather than being his protectors, are instead his prison guards. Down below, the captains and vice captains assemble in the research building, and we see Urahara with another plan as usual. Another guest who joins us is Yorichi's brother, Yushiro, and I was a damn fool to think Kubo would stop adding new characters to the mix. All the returning alive visor to here too, and Kubo bringing back so many characters adds to the feeling that this is truly the final arc and the final battle to come. With the assembly, there's several missing captains and vice captains, but they aim to head to the spirit palace as well, but this is a much longer process as it takes a ton of chapters for them to actually leave. Ichigo and the gang unsurprisingly are much faster than the captains, and they arrive standing before Yuha. I had questioned why Chad and Ganju were with the group, but Ichigo clearly does have a fan club who enjoys cheering him on. Standing before Yuha, it felt like the final battle was upon us, but it was rather a tease for things to come. Of Yuha's dialogue, he tells Ichigo he's soon to be crushed upon the gates of fate, and it immediately made me think back to one of my favorite quotes from Ichigo. The quote says, If fate is a millstone, then we are the grist. There is nothing we can do, so I wish for strength. If I cannot protect them from the wheel, then give me a strong blade and enough strength to shatter fate. 
fate is a central topic Ichigo comes back to, and despite fate and Yuha knowing what's to come, what Ichigo still wishes for all these hundreds of chapters is enough strength to shatter this very fate. Ichigo seeing the Soul King with the sword through his chest, Ichigo grabs the sword like King Arthur, and due to the Quincy blood compelling him, once gripping the sword, he kills the very Spirit King accidentally. Once more, Ichigo is helpless, unable to control himself, and he assists the very enemies he came to stop. Yuha stains his hands to prevent Ichigo from fighting with the clear head, and he puts the burden of all the worlds right now on Ichigo's shoulders. I did question why Yuha would aim to destroy the Spirit King, as it would cause his very own world to crumble, which is a bit convoluted because my initial impression was he was intending to destroy the Spirit King. The after effects of the Spirit King dying is that the worlds begin to shake, and it's very clear that all worlds will soon be no more. For the first time in all of Bleach, we see Urahara shocked upon this realization that the Soul King was killed, meaning both Squad Zero and Ichigo's team failed to stop Yuha. For subsequent chapters in a row, we see Urahara completely befuddled. In order to combat the current situation, we finally see something that shocks Urahara, Kamikake. Ukitake reveals he'll take the place of the Spirit King, and we see the shadow we saw earlier start protruding from his back. He calls it Mimihaki-sama. We then finally get to see the backstory of Ukitake. With him as a sick child, his grandmother offered his lungs to this ancient god called Mimihagi-sama. This ancient deity was said to be the right hand of the Spirit King, which I believe it to literally be the right arm of the Spirit King due to him being armless, and Ukitake now allowed the power of Mimihagi-sama to spread over the rest of his body in a process called Kamikake. Due to this offering, he now became the vessel for Mimihagi-sama, and now gives his life to serve as the new Spirit King and temporarily hold the balance between the worlds. Even Yuha in all his grandeur was unable to foresee this, and he angrily speaks to the arm, calling it the Spirit King himself. Yuha in anger ask why it would protect Soul Society, implying that the Spirit King shouldn't want to do so, likely due to the hinting at the Spirit King being a tool rather than a true ruler. He even questions if the Spirit King's will no longer dwells in the arm, which again drives home the point that the Spirit King was imprisoned rather than serving as a true king. Right as this happens, a scene that coincides perfectly is Shunzubi arriving to Mukin, calling out into the darkness. I've long awaited this. In this darkness, he calls out to Sosuke Aizen. Shunzui was permitted to use three keys on Aizen, but upon just using one with freeing his mouth, it appears as if Aizen took off the rest of the seals. From my impression, this was his suyetsu at work, because Shunzui proceeded to use two more keys to free his left eye and ankles. Despite being locked in Mukin for years, Aizen is still as crafty and smug as ever, and this was a giant highlight within reading Bleach this arc. Aizen is one of the best characters within this story, and these dark times call for even the most unlikely allies to be brought back. The only man to be able to counter the hacks of Yuha Bak, Aizen, the god of hacks. In order to permit Shunzui going to recruit Aizen, Central 46 had a safety valve within Shunzui's body that if he were to die, Mukin would be forever sealed off, ensuring Aizen wouldn't be able to escape. Shunzui then gestures to a chair for Aizen to sit to come up for fresh air, but one of the foolish guards went to bind Aizen, and by being close to him, the man lost his hands. Aizen has such strong spirit energy that he still destroys people around him just in his presence. I thought when presented with the chair, Aizen would be much happier, but he needs a little bit of bloodshed here and there. Shunzui and Aizen negotiate. Shunzui says that he's not asking for him to fight for Soul Society, rather, their interests aren't very different. Due to Aizen being so intrigued by this, it made me question what both of their interests truly are. I speculate that due to Aizen wanting to take the Spirit King's power in his place, and Yuha Bot getting in the way of that, that their interests could align that way. But the hidden detail between the text just leads to more questions, and that's one of the reasons I love Bleach. We're left with a mystery of some of these characters' intentions like Squad Zero. These subsequent chapters with Ukitake and Shunzui follow the theme of making deals with gods. Ukitake makes a deal with a god to become the spirit king and protect soul society, and Shunzui makes a request with a god within Aizen to fight alongside each other. For two best friends, thematically, these parallels fit perfectly. During the negotiation with gods, Ichigo faces off briefly versus Yuhabak, and Yuhabak plagiarizes Aizen saying that everything he's done has been part of his plan. Their fight, if you can even call it a fight, is more so a fight of words, with Yuha crushing Ichigo's spirit, and we see Uryu attack his former allies as Yuha seemingly pulls out Kamikake. This is where Yuha reveals his true new motivation, saying he'll take all that belongs to the Spirit King and consume him. As a side note, I'm unsure why Ichigo has yet to reveal his Bankai at this point, but I know we've all been waiting for it. Ichigo and Uryu have a dialogue, and Uryu still doesn't have a change of heart, and he attacks Ichigo and the gang, forcing them out of the Spirit Palace vicinity. I felt the intention of Uryu here was to stall time and gain trust amongst the Royal Guard, because he doesn't hurt Ichigo and Yoroichi that much. Rather, he just moves them from the premises. 
In the process with the newly added trust he gains, I imagine Uriel will be closer to his plan to betray Yuha. During this process, the Spirit King seems to fight back a little bit against Yuha, and despite his body never fighting back, the arm of the Soul King seems to possess the will of the body, but he's unable to really combat Yuha very much as he's soon ingested. With this absorption, it makes Ukitake's sacrifice fairly insignificant, and it seems we may never truly see his Bankai. Yuhabaku with this new power has the Spirit King's energy flood out around him, and if there was ever a doubt about the original enemy of the Spirit King, Hashwalth informs the Royal Guard that the Spirit King's enemies are the Shinigami. With this, this energy takes the appearance of black eyeballs and it descends upon the Serate, and despite their overwhelming number, Cher-sama arrives and destroys these eyeballs with ease. I found his conversation with Rukia pretty funny, complimenting her increase in rank and battle deeds being recognized. With every line he says, I read it in his smug and menacing voice, and it made the encounter all the more humorous. Urahara even points out that Aizen grew in strength since they last encountered each other. Aizen is just that type of dude. That despite being imprisoned and unable to move, his power is steadily increasing. Despite wiping away the eyeballs with his immense power, his chair didn't break, making that chair clearly one of the strongest characters in Bleach. Hell, while upon this chair, Aizen even says he'll shoot down the spirit palace and bring it down to the Serate. And now seeing a previous villain now helping out his fellow Shinigami is a sight to behold. His methodology is quite different, but their goal is still the same, well at least partially. No one wants to see Yuhabak on that throne. Despite his bold speech, we're informed through Mayuri that Aizen is incapable of doing so due to his technology, and during the verbal dispute, Sternmurder Yu sneak attacks Aizen, but soon after what was foreshadowed earlier occurs. Bosby kills Sternmurder Yu. The Lotto, Giselle, and Bosby all feel betrayed by Yuhabak, and subsequently they have the same goal, to kill him. This plot point I felt was really important to the Quincy. It shows that despite their seemingly overwhelming allegiance, the Sternmurder do have logic and the ability to not mindlessly follow their leaders, and I'm sure as hell glad Bosby is heading that front. As this takes place, our captains all these chapters later are still waiting to ascend to the Royal Palace, and while they take their time, we're brought back to Ichigo and the crew, and even Cone appears, and I thought Kubo had honestly forgotten him. The counterattack soon commences, and finally we're shown the mysterious individual all these chapters later that was hinted at. Grimshaw arrives through the Garganta, and not just him, adult Nell, and I didn't know who to be more excited to see. Nell always brings a smile to my face, and Grimshaw's Vegeta complex always gets me fired up. I'm really glad Kubo didn't forget about these characters, and the motivation for Grimshaw coming isn't anything of an ass pull. As the quote-unquote king of Waco Mundo, if Waco Mundo is destroyed, so is his kingdom. So the interest in stopping Yuha is mutual. Even Ririka and Yukio appear, making this a nice reunion from all the previous arcs. I was honestly surprised to see the Fullbringers, but it makes sense to utilize Yukio and Ririka's ability to infiltrate and launch a sneak attack that soon takes place. Within the Spirit Palace, the Royal Guards sit around as Yuha takes his new form. With integrating the Spirit King within himself, he now looks terrifying. With the black aura flowing around him and now eyes and a forehead covered in darkness, he scares even his royal guard, the only one unafraid is Hashwalth. Yuha genuinely looks horrific, and his power even threatens the royal guard due to the unintended damage, and Yuha then begins to remake his kingdom by bringing the Quincy City up to the Spirit Palace. I thought he couldn't get stronger, but I was wrong once more. Now able to act as a bona fide god and assemble his new kingdom, he now sets up the terrain for the final battle. With all the new darkness on Yuha's face, it would have been perfect for our man Ichibi, but unfortunately, he got the short end of the stick. The Shinigami along with our heroes now arrive back to the Spirit Palace, which now with the new terrain holds a lot more of an ominous aesthetic with the True World Castle overlooking the city. And now we finally have our war space. No more hopping from area to area, the Spirit Palace will serve as the final grounds for war. The Quincy's home court advantage is an understatement. The Quincy literally hold dominion over spirit particles in this area, making the Shinigami unable to create footholds, which usually allow them to move around freely. Our heroes soon realize they're split up, and would it be a bleach shark if everyone didn't get separated? The group separated from the rest is Kimpachi and Mayuri, and they were an unlikely duo I didn't know I needed. Both individuals who can now roam and act freely, I'd have watched a spin-off with them two in a heartbeat. Within Ichigo's group, the first foe we see is Asken, and rather than letting Asken finish his speech, Grimshaw interrupts him like a complete badass. Rather than fighting though, Asken instead runs away and he's genuinely a jokester. Of the Royal Guard, Asken is quickly becoming a favorite. We're then taken away from those antics and instead presented with Jugo, who is extremely skeptical of Uryu, going so far as to ask for his moves to be monitored. However, during this time, Bosby arrives with a personal vendetta against Jugo, and he questions if he knew all along about the Ashwulan. And Jugo asks would he believe him if he said he didn't know prior, and it made me get in my feelings with Bosby's response. He tells Jugo he would believe him because they're friends. It really is your day ones. Bosby in their fight mentions that at nighttime, Yuha and Hashwalth switch powers, and he'll kill them both. 
Having Jugo serve as the king during the night makes it so there's always someone ruling, and it's a really cool power system. Due to the familiarity and history Bosby and Hashwalth clearly have, we're then taken to the first major Quincy flashback. Bosby and Hashwalth met as kids, with Bosby always being leagues ahead in terms of natural ability and strength. And upon their first meeting, it's hinted at that Hashwalth was abused by his uncle, and he hates being called Jugo because that's what his uncle calls him. Despite how Hashwalth is now, as a child he was insecure and self-loathing, he was weak lamenting his lack of ability. Jugo and Bosby's village was eventually burned down by Yuha, and they vowed they would kill Yuha and join his inner circle to be able to do so. Quite ironic thinking now that Bosby was granted the ability of fire given that his village was burned down by Yuha himself, but it does fit the character type of Yuha so far. I had some suspicions when reading that despite Yuha burning down the village, that Hashwalth had some type of respect for Yuha due to him killing his abusive uncle in the process. There's then some really cool world building with the Quincy Army's discussion showing that the only place yet to be conquered was Soul Society, and that the Sternrunner would be created as a military force in order to conquer their last remaining place. This world building doesn't just add to the previous lore of the Quincy, but due to the timeline of when this took place, it implies the age of a lot of other characters including Boz and Hashwalth, who literally seem to be a thousand years old, which is mind-blowing. Additionally, I'm unsure how the history books didn't have the Quincy's world domination within it, but I love the world building that takes place in these chapters. As Boz and Jugo trained, Boz increased much faster, and despite Jugram's intensive training, he had no natural ability, but he kept trying to improve, to be strong enough to fulfill their goal. Eventually, the recruitment for the Sternmurder takes place, and Boz, after being talked down by one of the secret police, begins to fight versus him. As a kid, Boz is already a top-tier trash talker, and his personality through all this time remains fairly unchanged. I think him and Ichibi would get along quite well, and it's unfortunate they can never meet. Yuha eventually arrives and stops this conflict, bringing those around them to his knees. He states he has finally found his right hand, that being Jugram, the man without any true ability. As a kid, Jugo looks a lot like old man Zangetsu, and I'm unsure if that's intentional, but hearing now that he's Yuha's half, I do have some suspicions. But I don't think he meant it in the way that Stark and Lilynet were each other's half. Rather, Jugo is someone just like himself who can serve as his true right hand due to them not being able to utilize spirit energy the same way normal Quincy do. Jugo now with the chance to enact the dream of Boz and himself, Rather than Boz being happy, we see rage and jealousy in his eyes. It broke my heart seeing Jugo's kind and timid eyes reach his best friends, only to find rage. Jugo asks why he couldn't be happy for him, and Jugo goes so far as to tell Yuha that the one who should be his other half and serve him is Boz. Yuha then informs Jugo the truth, that Jugo can't absorb spirit particles and make that strength his own. Rather, he makes others around him stronger, which is how Boz gains so much strength through their training, and this enrages Boz, causing him to try to attack Yuha, only for Jugo to stop him. We're taken back to the present with a parallel scene, and the demeanor after all these years is inverse. Boz now hesitates to kill his friend, but he's met with the cold and calculated eyes of Jugo, who doesn't hesitate to cut down Boz. In their past, Jugo always refused to fight back, but now he doesn't hesitate. He shows his superiority in combat over Boz, and despite Boz now becoming such an important Quincy within the story, as flashbacks tend to do, they precede the death and defeat of the individual within the flashback. Boz, despite his life fading out, he tells Jugo that he always thought being defeated by him would be more frustrating. But instead, he seems to take pride in his friend, his at one point follower, his follower now surpassing him. Despite Jugo always being weaker than him, they lived like brothers, and it's an emotional scene to see Boz be taken down by his one true friend. Bosby focused his entire life on killing Yuha and avenging his family, serving under Yuha with the sole intent for all these hundreds of years, only to be thwarted by the man he took his vow with. This flashback, despite being so sad, it gives me a glimmer of hope that Jugo never forgot their promise, their vow, that maybe just maybe he'll enact that revenge upon Yuha. I sure hope Hashwalt is just a good actor and is only doing this out of necessity, because witnessing Boz die really hurt my soul. With this fight concluding, we're left with so much anticipation of what's to come next. With all our heroes finally on the battlefield and Yuha now standing as a god in his kingdom known as the True World Castle, we're in store for someone to usurp Yuha Bak, the current god of our story. From the depths of hell we brought back a god to fight versus this god within Aizen, and we're still yet to see the true power of some of these most famed characters of the series. There's still so much mystery involving what's to come, but knowing our heroes have Aizen and Urahara the masterminds of the series on their side, it gives me hope for our final battle. How powerful will these unrevealed Bankai be? Is their treachery within the ranks of the Shinigami and Quincy? Will this last segment of the arc and ending of the series clear up all the questions we've long had? I guess we'll find out next time. If you stuck around this long, please drop a subscription as we are so close to nearing the end of this series. The Thousand Year Blood War has been a roller coaster of emotions and it doesn't seem to be slowing down. I can't thank you all enough for your continued support. I love you all dearly. Similarly to what Rukia said to Ichigo, this isn't goodbye, but see you later. As always, 
be greedier.